James Comey, can I first ask you what your reaction was to seeing Joe Biden sworn in today as president and to see the end of four years of the Trump presidency? Tremendous relief, just relief I actually hadn't even expected to feel as strongly as I did, and emotion for the country, really for the entire world, that democracy held, the rule of law held, and as a security professional that we were able to secure this transition of power. So uh, I felt like layers were coming off of my shoulders. You say in your new book that 2016 was the first time in your adult life you didn't vote in the presidential election. Can I ask you whether you voted this time? I did, and I wore a Biden-Harris T-shirt under my coat as I went to vote. You say that the FBI wanted no part in the 2016 election, which was, quote, a battle between the two least trusted candidates in the history of modern polling. How did America get to that point? I'm not sure. In some ways, I think it was an inevitable product of the polarization and the anxiety over change in America. America has been changing dramatically, right? We elected a black man president for two terms. Uh, we, we legalized gay marriage. We're on, our, on a path to having the white majority no longer be the majority. And so you, historians, I think, would tell us that in light of that much change, you were inevitably gonna have strong backlash and strong separation and polarization. We've sure seen it. And I'm optimistic that now we've reached an inflection point where we will heal and start to come back together. Would you do anything differently from that period? I don't, honestly, no is the answer. I mean, assuming I can't take a magic wand back in time and not be involved at all in some of the really controversial decisions, but being there, we made decisions, I believe, for the right reasons, and I think our thinking will stand the test of time. There are some small ways in which I think I should have stood up straighter in some of my early encounters with Donald Trump. Instead of bending a little bit in some of my language to try and accommodate, avoid a war, I should have seen that a, a collision between us was inevitable. That just would have meant I got fired sooner. But in the main, other than regretting having to be part of a lot of it, I, I don't think differently about the decisions. Trust in politics seems to have deteriorated even further in the last four years. I think that's right. And a large part of the drop in trust in our institutions and in our civil society has been the product of relentless lying by a demagogue president. Look, it's a depressing thing to admit, but lying works when it comes from the top office in the land and then is echoed in media and by other enablers in and outside of government. People believe what the head of a government says in a democracy, and that's normally a healthy thing. It's deeply unhealthy when the head of government is a, is a sociopath, to be honest. And that shapes, unfortunately, millions of people in a harmful way. So our challenge as a country is to help those people out of that fog of lies. You can't do that by yelling at them. You have to find a way for them to emerge from that fog. And I think today we began that journey. A central theme in your book is the issue of trust as you identify it through your career as a defence lawyer, a district attorney, and then leading the FBI. Can you explain for our audience how your thoughts on this developed and influenced the way you worked? I started out as a young prosecutor in Manhattan, working for an ambitious, slightly older, but still young chief prosecutor named Rudy Giuliani, who's kind of a different guy today. And I learned through mistakes and through supervision that truth was everything, that it was a real thing. There is a thing that is called the truth. And then my job was always to speak it and to insist that others in the justice system speak it. And that my client, when I was a government lawyer, was not a person. It wasn't Rudy. It was a concept, justice. And that I understood immediately. Right? Truth is everything. You don't represent a person, you represent an idea. It took me longer to realize, not until I became a leader, that just telling the truth and finding it wasn't enough, that I had to find a way to share it and our work with the people we served. And that's where I end up with the formula that's on the cover of the book. Truth plus transparency is the recipe that produces trust. So I didn't see all of that early in my career, and but figured it out from having to deal with difficult situations and, and be honest and open with people about what we were doing and why. That came into force when you were head of the FBI, as well as some of those earlier periods in your career when you had to publicly distance yourself from your bosses. Yeah, that's right. As the leader of an institution like the FBI, 
which depends upon the trust of the American people, that depends upon the American people seeing it as apart from political tribes, you have to be a bit of a public figure. Even if you're like me and you never want to run for office, you don't want to be famous, you must do the work and show the work to the American people, especially when there's reason to believe that if you don't show it, they're going to conclude you're part of one of the warring political tribes. Because when that happens, you've lost their trust and the ability to protect a country. What are the key things that have to be done to rebuild trust, not just in politics, but in institutions like the Justice Department and the FBI? So the path back in the states for the Justice Department, which includes the FBI, is for the new president to pick great leaders, people who will radiate the values of the institution for two reasons. First, to foster the trust and confidence of the people of the country who see that person as above politics and to inspire those inside the institution to act consistent with the institution's culture. That second piece is actually the easier one in the states right now because Donald Trump wasn't in office long enough to change the culture of the FBI or the culture of the Justice Department. And so all the new leadership needs to do is let people be what's already written on their hearts. The harder thing will be to regain the trust of those who have been lied to for so long about the institution. That will come over time with doing the work and showing it triumphs and, and failures to the American people in detail. That must also extend out to police forces, mustn't it? That's absolutely right. Police forces at the local level depend upon the trust of the communities that they serve and protect. We have a problem in the states that we've had almost since the country was founded, that there are there's a estrangement between police organizations, and especially black community across the country, a legacy of the the original sin of the United States, racism and slavery, and it's alive still today. The path to fixing that is actually quite similar to fixing the reputation of the Department of Justice. It's to be transparent and up close. It's hard to hate up close. You seem optimistic about restoring that trust despite everything that's happened. Can you compare the task ahead with what happened after Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal? How do they rebuild trust after that period? History, some wise person said, it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And today's events rhyme with those of Watergate, where you had a disgraced, fallen criminal of a president leave office with very low approval ratings, having left behind wreckage, and destroyed the trust of the American people in, in our institutions. And one of the primary missions of the new president after Nixon was chased from office was to restore confidence in the Justice Department and the FBI a very similar challenge to what we face now. And to do that, the new president, Gerald Ford, did two things, one of which was uncontroversial, one which was very controversial. First, he picked a great leader for the Department of Justice, someone who would radiate the values of the institution. Joe Biden has done that in picking a former judge to be the attorney general. Second, he decided President Ford not to pursue Richard Nixon criminally, and instead to turn past him and look away from him. That's a really hard decision. But Joe Biden and the Justice Department are going to have to make it. I actually may surprise some of your viewers as someone Donald Trump has said should be in jail for four years, although I might like to prosecute him personally. I actually don't think it's in America's best interest to devote three years to the Donald Trump show in a prosecution in our nation's capital. I think the wiser course, as hard as it is, is to look away and let other mechanisms of accountability work on him but let him go to Florida and do whatever the heck he does down there and not dominate our life while the new president tries to heal us. Will it be easier or harder this time? We've got a very different media environment, but also we've had four years of an attack on the institutions coming from the very top of the government. I think it'll be both easier and harder for the Biden administration and the country to heal as compared to the Nixon administration and the departure of Richard Nixon. Easier in the sense that the institutions are healthier today. The Justice Department and the FBI were deeply troubled when Nixon left office, deeply troubled. And have been doing all kinds of things, including trying to ruin the lives of civil rights leaders, trying to get Martin Luther King to kill himself, believe it or not. And so there was a legacy of stain in the FBI in 1974 that there isn't today. The culture is fundamentally healthy, flawed because it's a human culture, but fundamentally healthy. So in that respect, it'll be easier. The way in which it'll be harder is that public opinion is not only dramatically split, it's reinforced by these echo chambers that we're all able to create for ourselves 
in the online environments that we build for ourselves. And so it will be harder than it was in 1974 to move people out of that fog of lies that they're trapped in. And so in that respect, it'll be more difficult. Where do the major political parties fit into this process? And particularly, what does the Republican Party need to do now? The Republican Party has to be burnt to the ground in some form or fashion. It doesn't stand for anything that is valuable to our country. It doesn't stand for anything that is other than a cult of personality around a man who is a demagogue and a liar. So if it's going to survive, and we need two healthy parties to have a healthy democracy, it has to be rebuilt in some way. I, I'm not expert enough or good enough at seeing the future to say what that will be. But I think you're going to need something like what happened in this country in the 1850s when the Republican Party was born out of the wreckage of the Whig Party uh, over a dispute on how to think about slavery, especially. So I think you may see principled Republicans splitting off or finding a way to push the Trumpists off so they can reconstitute the Republican Party on a set of real values. How do you rebuild trust in such a period of extraordinary political polarization? One of the hardest things to do as a human being is to admit that you've been fooled, especially about things that really matter, about a virus, about an election, about our institutions. And so the journey from being fooled to a healthier place is a very hard one. And it's not made by someone shouting at the victim of the fraud, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're wrong, look at the facts, look at the facts. Now, you don't want to embarrass people. No one's going to have been involved with Donald Trump by the time we're done here. It's important to let people tell themselves that story and make the journey out of the fog and not to embarrass them or try and hold them up. Those who committed crimes, those who physically attacked our democracy, they will be held accountable. But the others, they need to be able to find their way and so you ought to let them find their way out of it. You've described the storming of the Capitol as America's own Chernobyl. Was it an inflection point in American history? I think the American people were shocked in the overwhelming main of the American population to see this assault, shocked by an attack on this symbol, which is the most important symbol in our democracy. We will still have, as we've always had in America, a radioactive stew of conspiracy-minded people, racist, misogynist, anti-immigrant crazies. We just have to shrink the size of that radioactive collection and push it back into the containment building. How important to the rebuilding process is an impeachment trial of Donald Trump? I think a trial in the United States Senate to hold Donald Trump accountable for his incitement of the attack on our democracy on the Capitol is an important thing that we have to do to hold him accountable. It'll be a distraction of some sort, but actually I think the distracting is well outweighed by the importance of accountability and that vote by the Senate, not just to convict him, but to bar him under American law from ever serving public office again. We need Donald Trump out of our lives, out of our heads, out of our spotlight, with a stamp on him that he crossed a line that no Americans could tolerate the crossing of. And so I think a trial will be very important to do that. Two crucial issues that require trust in basic facts are COVID and climate change. How much of an issue will this be for President Biden in the post-Trump era? I think it'll be easier for Joe Biden to lead Americans out of a fog of lies about the virus than people expect because the virus has been ravaging our country and killing thousands of people every day. And so those Americans who were lied to by Donald Trump have seen in their peripheral vision the death and sickness of lots of people around them. And so on some level, they know that they've been lied to. I think that, that makes it easier for the new president to help them see what we all have to do to keep this under control. There's been a lot of talk about the growth of right-wing terrorism at home in America, but what's happening to terror around the world? How much of a threat is it to the United States and Australia? The place to keep an eye on is Afghanistan. As, as the, the states especially tries to withdraw forces from Afghanistan, what happens there? Does it become a safe haven again? Is Al-Qaeda reborn there? Is the Islamic State reborn there? It's a long way of saying the problem's not going to go away. I think the threat is diminished now as against five, eight years ago, but it's not gone. Of course, a lot of your attention as head of the FBI was on Russian interference in US politics. How big a threat do you now think Chinese influence is at home and abroad? 
I think both the states and Australia face the same challenge, a rising China that in some ways is a great thing for trade in particular, but in other ways it's going to really test us because the Chinese are extremely aggressive about stealing our intellectual property, trying to uh, expand their control over certain shipping lanes, all of that sort of thing. So I think that the next 50 years in public life in Australia and in the States is going to be dominated by navigating that inevitable conflict. And I don't mean war, I just mean conflict of different sorts with a, with a rising China. It's a threat that's much larger, more sophisticated and, and worldwide than the threat from the Russian authoritarian. James Cummy, thanks so much for your observations. Thanks for your time, Laura. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.